Well, hey, welcome to Church Online. I'm Adam. I help out with Journey Teens here, and I'm super excited to get to, to be with you uh, for this time, to get to talk about one of my favorite things, movies and faith. Um, I grew up a kid of pop culture. I had a TV in my room, had a little box so I could get some channels, had a VHS player and a DVD player, uh, and I just I was constantly watching movies, just consuming them. I had a DVD collection, a pretty large DVD collection. Don't really have that anymore because what's the point? But one movie I still own, it's one of my favorite movies, extremely loud and incredibly close. It's one of the only movies, to my knowledge, that has the events of 9-11 as sort of a, as part of the plot, but isn't a war movie. It, in fact, it just looks at uh, this kid Oscar and his mom who... Uh, they lose uh, Thomas, husband and father, in the events of 9-11. And it's sort of this really raw look at grief and loss and, and how, how families must have felt and dealt with, with that pain. And, uh, it's a yearly watch for me. Uh, I think every 10 minutes in the movie I get a little misty-eyed and uh, it's good. It's a good little checkup, a little heart checkup to make sure you're still feeling things. But anyways, the movie, like I said, it's, it's 9-11 is a, is a pretty big plot point. Oscar loses his dad, Thomas, uh, on what Oscar calls the worst day. And, uh, but they have this really special relationship that you get a glimpse of in the first 10-ish minutes of the movie where uh, Thomas and Oscar do this thing uh, that I think can be likened to geocaching, where Thomas and Oscar will go out and they'll look for things in the city and Thomas will kind of give Oscar objectives or little clues or riddles to find things, rocks, stuff on the street, uh, newsstands, grab something from a newsstand or whatnot, not steal, but you know, buy something from the newsstand and uh, Oscar will sort of report back and be like, look, I found the answer to your thing or I found what you were taught or what you asked me to find. And, uh, one of the big things that they're looking for that Thomas sort of creates for Oscar is the sixth borough. Uh, if you know New York, there's only five boroughs, but Thomas creates this sort of sixth borough where everything is much better, the people are better, the food is better, the parks are better, everything is better, nicer, uh, maybe more perfect. It's almost like a heaven on earth kind of thing. And uh, they're looking for clues and hints of this sixth borough. And so... Like I said, Thomas is in the towers on that day, and uh, the movie kind of jumps a year ahead, and uh, Oscar has this little cubby in his closet where he's got pictures of his dad on the wall, and he, he's got the answering machine with his dad's last messages uh, from that day where he's, he's talking to Oscar, saying, I love you, and uh, you know I really wanted to talk to you, um, and, and Oscar just plays that over and over again as he sits in the closet. One day, Oscar goes into his dad's closet uh, just to root around, I guess, and he ends up finding this mysterious little key in an envelope with the name Black written on it. And so Oscar does what his dad taught him to do, which is go find the answer to this clue or this riddle. So Oscar gets into the phone book, writes down everybody's name with the last name Black and writes down their address and gets out a map in New York and plots out the addresses and has this whole plan that if he does X amount of houses every Saturday within three years, he should be able to find the owner of the key. And so uh, all of this, though, is driven by Oscar is afraid he's losing his dad again. He talks about it feels like his dad is slipping away. Um, that he's losing time with his dad, that all these memories are sort of fading. And so this is sort of an attempt to keep his dad alive again, uh, to keep his dad with him uh, so that he doesn't lose him twice. So what I want to, it's just my favorite topic, so I just want to jump right into it. But I want to talk about this idea of abiding in Jesus and how I think Oscar gives us a glimpse at what abiding means. You see, Oscar is so wants to stay connected with his dad, so much so that he creates a little space where he can stay. He's able to talk to his dad and hear from his dad and 
And then he does what his dad teaches him. And so abiding in his dad. And so when we abide in Jesus, what does that mean? What does that look like? So abiding means to live in or to dwell in, to live in Jesus or to dwell in Jesus. And Jesus calls us to this. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. So abiding in Jesus means that Jesus abides in us. To live in Jesus, Jesus lives in us. So Jesus is our source. He is the source of life. He is the source of what we know or how we do things. Because we can. Uh, it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So what do we learn to do? But when we abide in Jesus, we get to we look at the life of Jesus and we see just what he did and we learn from him and we go with him in a sense. And we don't have him here, but we do see what it was like to be with him because his friends wrote down all these things he did. And so, sort of like how Thomas shows Oscar, Jesus shows us, right? Jesus takes his friends to Zacchaeus' house where they eat with Zacchaeus, a tax collector, a, a pretty big cheat. Uh, he stores up a lot of his own wealth. He overtaxes people. He enriches himself, and they go and they eat at his house, which is something they would have never done otherwise. They wouldn't have associated with, with Zacchaeus. Jesus shows his friends how to feed people. When Jesus is teaching, there's 5,000 people. It's been all day. They're hungry, and... His friends come to him and say, we got to send them away to go eat, and then they can come back later. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to show you how to feed them. Jesus shows his friends how to withhold judgment and to uh, protect the broken. There's a woman, she's been judged by the religious leaders, and they're going to stone her to death for her sin. And Jesus steps in the way and says, nah, not today, not her. She's mine. She's with me. And even his friends, uh, they would have been conflicted and thinking, well, she did the crime, so she's got to do, or she's got to get the punishment. Jesus says, no, that's not how this works anymore. When Jesus' friends are debating who, the, who, who is the better friend, who is the better disciple, uh, Jesus is hanging out with these children, just playing, laughing, having a good time. And he says, why not, why don't you guys just chill out and be like these kids and just hang out? Why has why there got to be a better friend or a best friend? Jesus shows his friends the way of peace. In one of Jesus' last moments, um, the soldiers are coming to take him away. They're going to crucify him. And Peter gets a sword and he just kind of flails it about and chops an ear off a soldier. And Jesus says, no, we don't do that. And he willingly goes with the soldiers knowing he's going to die. He willingly lays his life down. And he dies a death where he, he bears all the weight of our sin and shame for us. And then, what I think we don't often talk about enough is that Jesus shows his friends resurrection. How to come alive again. How to be reborn in a sense. Um, I think, because when we live in Jesus, we're laying our own life down and we're coming alive in Jesus because Jesus begins to live in us as we live in him and we start to look more like Jesus. Jesus is essentially showing us how to find the sixth burrow. So when we abide in Jesus, when we see what Jesus is doing in these stories, we're able to learn and to go and be just as Oscar has learned from his dad and is still able to go and do what his dad taught him to look. So what does it look like to abide in Jesus? What does this mean to live in Jesus? How does that, how does that practically play out in our lives? I think it's beautiful. Um, I mean, it's sad, but Oscar has, like I said, this little cubby in his closet. Literally, he pulls a little sliding door and he crawls up, pulls the door shut. It's this little space. He just kind of lays up against the wall and 
He's got the pictures of his dad that he talks to, and he's got the answering machine where he can hear his dad's voice. And he just spends time just in the quiet, just being there. And he just is. I think that's pretty simple. And I think that's something we can learn from is, do we just dwell with Jesus, in Jesus? We're able to talk to Jesus by prayer, through prayer. We're able to hear from Jesus through the Bible. Sometimes literally, right, if you like audio Bibles. I know that's something that I've been doing this year. I've never really done, and that really changes how you experience the Bible when you hear different voices reading it. Maybe, maybe for you it's the Bible, a notebook, some highlighters and pens at a desk. Maybe it's on the back deck. Maybe you have a little cubby you can go hide away in, a little cozy little spot. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's out in the woods. You're sitting on a bench on one of the paths at Hoffmaster, and, and you're just being. You're hearing from God. You're talking to God. You're spending that time abiding and learning. And I think this is important. I think... To have this intentional space, whatever it looks like for you, if it is just simply curling up, you've got your Bible, you spend some time in prayer, you're reading, you're learning, you're seeing, you're being taught how to go. I think this is, an, this is important. Um, and I think Oscar shows us why this is important in a way, um, at least through the movie, through the lens of the movie. When Oscar spends this time with his dad or what he's learned from his dad, there's sort of these two moments that stick out to me. Uh, the first one is that it's, this, it's one of Oscar's first visits with this woman named Abby Black. When Oscar gets to her, uh, her house to ask her about the key, Abby is in the middle of watching her husband pack everything up and leave. Uh, and Oscar doesn't catch on until a few minutes after being there. He's got a, you know, he had a glass of water or milk. And the husband is actually sort of faceless through this whole scene. And he's just moving in and out of the frame. And all you see is his head with the phone. Or you just see sort of the bottom half. He's hauling boxes out. And Abby's just on the stairs. And Oscar sort of slows down and zones in on Abby. And, and suddenly he forgets about the key, really. It's not about the key anymore. He's able to slow down and zone in on Abby. And he asks her, uh, in the midst of this turmoil, this crazy thing in her life, and only the way a kid can ask, a nine-year-old kid can ask, he just asks her, can I give you a kiss? And it's, it's, it's what he, he sees a hurting person and knows that they need to be loved, and that's the only way he can think of, of how to show her love. And uh, So I'm not advocating for you to just start kissing everyone, but I think that's just a key moment of Thomas showed Oscar how to go and be, and to search, and to pay attention, and to be aware of what's going on in the world around him. And so when Oscar, who is, you know, he wants to find the owner of this key, he wants to stay connected to his dad. And what he calls a distraction, I think, is actually him being more connected to his dad than anything. But he slows down and he sees Abby in her brokenness and her hurt, and he reaches out in love. And so when we abide in Jesus, we're able to see, be aware of, pay attention to the people and the world around us, the brokenness, the hurt, and to reach out in love. So First John... Chapter 4 said, And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. We, we start to love as Jesus loved. We slow down enough and we're attuned to those around us. And it says our love grows more perfect. It doesn't say it is perfect, but it grows more perfect. And so it means it takes practice. It takes listening what Jesus is, is telling us, is showing us in his life. The second moment is when Oscar has to cross a bridge. 
it starts having a little mini panic attack and all these images are flashing off on the screen of people in the city and he and his monologue over it is getting more frenzied and speeding up and he's talking about all the big and scary things and and the loud things and all the stuff that's sort of freaking him out because he's got to cross this bridge which he's afraid of this bridge and then suddenly everything stops and he has this memory and so we're brought to this flashback of Thomas and Oscar at the park and Thomas is trying to get Oscar to go on the swing and Oscar is scared of swings because you can get hurt and Thomas is saying come on try it and Oscar opens his eyes and he bolts across the bridge so when we abide in Jesus when we are living in Jesus and Jesus is living in us when we're out and we're in the midst of our crazy lives, we're able to recall his voice and his promises. Colossians 2 says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So when we live in Jesus when we're in the midst of whatever it is in our daily lives, when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're at practice, when we're parenting our kids, when we're, on the, when we're driving to the third activity that night, when we're with our partners, when we're with our friends, we are able to, in the midst of everything, recall what Jesus promises us and what Jesus shows us how to live. I think of just this past week, we've been on vacation and um, we, it was the very first day, we're excited, we're going to Detroit and I got, I got frustrated and angry and I yelled at my wife and, and in front of my daughter who for her everything is just fun and games. But immediately afterwards I was like, this isn't how Jesus wants me to talk to my wife. And this isn't how my daughter should grow up thinking she should be talked to. And I'm able to remember that this, is, this isn't the way Jesus wants things. So what do you do in that moment? You say, I'm sorry, right? And then I had a talk with my daughter and so that's not, that's not what we do. That's not what I do. That's not what I should do. Because I'm able to remember how Jesus lived and to stay connected and to abide in him, to lay myself down, my life down, to be resurrected in him and to kind of put this to death. And it's a daily thing as we continue to make our love more perfect, to practice our love getting more perfect, we're sort of laying all these things in our life down every day. We're laying it to death with Jesus, and we're coming alive in Jesus. So, abiding in Jesus. What does that look like for you? What, are, what is that space for you? What are those practices for you? Is it reading the Bible? Is it listening to the Bible? Is it journaling? Is it, is it a prayer walk through the woods? Um, but how are we listening to Jesus, hanging on like Oscar to his answering machine? We have our way of hearing Jesus through the Bible. And then maybe you don't have a shrine of Jesus in a cubby, but you're still able to talk to him, to go to him in prayer. All of this so that you may be rooted in him as a branch to a vine, so that you may live like him in this world, in the midst of everything.